What's up, guys? Lunch money time. While well, while she's trying to get rich, the rest of us is trying to get our lunch money right. Bang, bang. What's up? Oh, not much. You look like you're in prison with your prisoner outfit this on there. This is not at all what a prisoner outfit looks like. Or but... maybe it's like a sailor outfit. Maybe. Okay. Don't forget, lunch money is now sponsored by BlockFi. BlockFi is... Has three products you can buy and sell crypto. You can deposit crypto and earn a US dollar loan, or I guess get a US dollar loan. You can't really earn it, but you can get a US dollar loan against your crypto collateral, and you can earn ah, that's where the earn part goes earn 8.6% APY in an interest bearing account. No brainer. Go and check out BlockFi. I'm an investor, I sit on the board, I'm a user. Basically, it's my favorite company in crypto. Go check them out. BlockFi.com slash pomp 8.6% APY. You ain't going to get that at your granddaddy's checking account or saving I got to get rid of that brown sugar thing right here. Okay. What's going on in uh, the economist Stephen Roach's world? Who is Stephen Roach? He's an economist. economist. Okay. Economist Stephen Roach warns- I'm no genius, but I got that one. Warns that next year will be brutal for the dollar. Not only does he see growing odds of a double dip recession. Is that like the fat cat bounce? Um, it's called a dead cat bounce. <laughs> oh. um, the Yale University senior fellow believes his seemingly crazed idea that the dollar would crash wouldn't be so crazy anymore. Ooh. Ooh. This makes no sense what he's saying. Wait, why? Because in a recession, the dollar gets stronger. It doesn't crash. Right now, but, that's you, a, but it's a double dip recession. I think it's a recession, then it goes no, up, we, we, it No, we, we had a recession. The Fed stepped in. They injected a bunch of liquidity into the market. So think think of it like a seesaw, right? Yeah. For those of you at home, where am I? Think of it like a seesaw. As the dollar strengthens, asset prices go down, right? Because it's a fraction. So let's say a, a stock is one share, right? Is what yeah. you're buying and is denominated in dollars. And so if it takes more dollars to buy that share, that means that the dollar is weakening, right? It, you need more of them to buy it. But if it takes less dollars to buy that right. share, then he the dollar is strengthening. He elaborates, lacking in saving and wanting to grow, we run these current account deficits to borrow plus saving, surplus. Uh, surplus saving. And that always pushes the currencies lower. The dollar is not immune to that time honored adjustment. I do not know what I just said. So the way to think about this is in a recession, there's usually a liquidity crisis. So even just looking the last couple of days, you probably haven't been paying attention to this, but stocks have sold off. So stocks are down, they're down about 9%, almost 10%, right? And when they're selling off, if you look over the last four days, the dollar has actually increased in strength more in the last four days than it has at almost any period in this recession. So again, it's that seesaw. So when prices go down, dollar strengthens. When the prices go up, the dollar weakens. So what he's basically saying is prices are gonna go down and the dollar is gonna crash. That's not how it works. And so unless I'm missing something that he's saying here, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. What I do believe is possible is that asset prices can continue to pump through Federal Reserve and other central bank manipulation and the dollar can crash. So there's a possibility that the dollar crashes. It's just going to be in a different scenario than what he's describing. Are you saying Mr. Roach doesn't know what he's talking about? I'm saying that economists are uh, very academic and uh, the real world is sometimes remember, not in line with their views. Do you remember last time where it was like 50% of economists say this and I was like, okay, but what did the other 50% say? Okay, <laughs> JP Morgan Chase is close to paying almost $1 billion to resolve government investigation into the alleged manipulation of metal and treasuries markets. That's a billion dollar fine. So, yeah, this would a penalty of that size would be a record for spoofing, which is when sophisticated traders flood markets with orders that they have no intention of actually executing. The practice was banned after the 2008 financial crisis. A lot of things were banned after the 2008. You know what financial spoofing crisis. is? Yeah. What? It's like when all these traders put the trades up, but they don't have any intention of trading them, so they just flood the market, and it looks like there's a lot of um, um, what is it called? Not demand, but surplus. No, demand. Oh, demand. So basically what they do is, in a very overgeneralized manner, is let's say something's trading at $10. They'll put in buy orders at a certain price, right? Or sell orders or whatever. Yeah. And what they're trying to do is if everyone sees, oh, wait, there's a ton of people who want to buy this at $12 and it's sitting at 10 naturally the price will go like start moving up. That so doesn't you, sound right. And then basically when it gets higher, then they just pull the order. 
And so it never actually executes. I can't believe you can just pull the order. Well, think about it. If you're saying, hey, I want to buy this at $12, it's at $10, right? Or, or let, better would be, uh, I want to buy it at $9. It's sitting currently at 10 as it's dropping, right? Yeah. And then it gets down to $9. Ah, never mind, I don't want to buy it anymore, hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, well, look, all this stuff goes on everywhere. It's a cat and mouse game between the banks and law enforcement. The fact that it's a billion dollar fine. A billion fines, dollars. That's big, but it's not really that big. Right? <sighs> Does it say what uh, JP Morgan's revenue? No, but I can look it but up. But it was part of a 14 count criminal uh, case. I feel like JP Morgan's always in something. Yeah, well, they're just a big bank, right? And so so it's, their revenue is $115.6 billion. Last year. So literally, it's less than 1% of their revenue last year. Think about it that way. Less than 1% of their revenue. Yeah, so literally, they made $115 billion in revenue, and they had to pay a billion-dollar fine. Still. So it's like, the better question is, how much money did they make off of the metals desk, right? Let's say that they made $3 billion, came off their metals desk, and it's only a billion-dollar fine. It actually is profitable to do this, even That's with the fine. That's crazy. And so what a lot That's of banks crazy. do is, is they just uh, budget in money to pay fines and, and when they get in trouble and stuff it's just part of the business model i don't like it all right what's next all right mark cuban mr mark so there's 13 million americans unemployed and thousands of businesses permanently cr closed across the u.s but congress is in an impasse and it looks unlikely that a deal on another stimulus package will happen anytime soon so mark cuban said uh there are two economies one, or sorry, or two sets of realities right now. One for those who are able to stay afloat and one for those who are unable to. Those without help are struggling badly. He says we need to get them help. So K-shaped recovery. Everyone was talking about, is it going to be an okay. L? So drop and then it goes sideways. Is it going to be a V? Is it going to drop and come back right away? Uh, and so now there's talk of something called a K-shaped recovery, right? If you think of just a, like a letter K. Some people prosper, other people don't. Yep. And I wrote this morning and put, published it out uh, publicly that uh, there's all this data now coming out. Simple things like um, let's take math progress in students. So they have a way of measuring basically how, uh, how much progress are students making in these online uh, math stuff. And uh, if you look at the total number, it's up four and a half percent since the beginning of this year. Stuff? Like like classes, right? Like basically are students oh. uh, progressing in math. So it's up 4.5% since the beginning of the year as a total for the national average. Sounds pretty good. When you break it out by high income and low income, the high income students are up over 50%, right? Than they were in January. Yeah. The low income students are down almost 30%. So literally, the high income is way up in the air, low income's down. I wrote a whole article about financial literacy around this, but go on. That was just math. Then, if you look at employment, basically, if you have a high-paying job, you we're almost at full employment to where we were, or not full employment, but we were at employment where we were in January. So essentially, for high-income workers, the recession's over. Like, they're, they're back to work, everything's great. If you're a low income worker, it's more than 20% down. And so therefore, again, there's the, these two Americas that are playing out. The rich are getting richer because asset prices are going up. And also they're back to employment levels that they were before, consumer spending's back, all that kind of stuff. But if you are not rich, then you end up actually having high levels of unemployment. I think 80% of the job loss right now is coming from uh, low income type roles. So we're talking we're talking like seasonal jobs. Well, it's just, um, it's service, hospitality. Like some of the other data points I remember are, uh, if you look at small businesses across America, 20% of them are not open right now compared to January. Uh, some of that's permanent closure. Some of that's still, they're just closed. You keep yawning. Uh, sorry. And, and if you break out that 20%, uh, it's like 50%, give or take, is leisure and hospitality, right? And then if you look at things like restaurants and stuff like that, maybe that's like, 30 or 25 percent or whatever but there's certain industries that are getting hammered and then the saddest part of the entire thing in, in my opinion is if you actually look at consumer spending total it's down uh i think it was down like four percent right and our economy was built on well this. across the united states it's down four percent if you break it out by high income and low income rich people are spending 10 percent less than they were in january People who are not rich, low income, Interesting. they're spending more. Why? 
because again, it's, it goes back to the whole idea of like, if everyone doesn't experience the same level of inflation, everyone doesn't have the same needs. So things like, um, if you're a low income, right, you've got to go buy food, you've got to buy transportation. Well, if you don't have a job, you actually have more time to go do things and spend money on, uh, your costs are actually going up in some cases. Uh, and that can be because literally the goods that, that you buy are different than the goods that somebody who's high income buys. And therefore there's literally a gap. So if you think about a low income uh, family today, they're more likely to be unemployed. They're more likely to be spending more on a percentage basis than high income people. And also if they have children, their children are getting a, uh, or their education is going down in terms of progress rather than going I up. Think, I, I do think that it's like inequality starts early and it does start with education. As someone who's been in schools where uh, very, very, uh, no like lower income schools. And then I went to something that was a little bit more high income, all public schools. It, it just, you can see the difference in education and in, uh, in teaching and everything. Well, I, in fifth grade, I think it was fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade, I can't remember. I think it was fifth grade. Uh, I, I went to public school all the way through to fifth grade. And, all the way to fifth well, grade. Well, hold on. And in fifth grade, uh, in the middle of the year, my parents took me out. Uh, I maybe wasn't the best behaving kid, but uh, we can imagine. I remember literally like it was so it was such like cognitive dissonance because I was in a public school one week and the next week I was in this private school. Uh, yeah. How was private school? They weren't they, they weren't screwing well, around. I like I started saying things that I would say in the public school and they were just like, we don't do that here. And I was like, what do you mean you don't do that here? Like, well, what, what I remember, I like, is- dropped the F-bomb or something. <laughs> God. I literally in remember school. I literally remember I like oh. in the hallway I said it and like a kid went and ran and told the teacher and I was just but, like yo I'm gonna whoop your ass but even within public school so I was in public school all the way through high school and call or yeah and college but um like you would notice the difference between like on level classes and then honors classes and AP classes and in on level classes uh, the teachers really put a premium on uh, are you going to be on time? Are you sitting? Are you quiet? Are you whatever? And then my AP classes, like literally I could come in the middle of class. They wouldn't bat an eye because they knew that I would get my work done. I would sit, I would whatever. But it's just like that level of trust that you don't get. I don't know. It's just, I don't know. Mm, I don't like it. The so, the, uh, the school that I went to uh, for high school was also uh, real crazy and um I didn't know that we had, I knew we had honors classes, but what's the other one called? AP. Yeah. When I was in college, somebody, I asked them if they had like, I don't know, like a science class or something. And they were like, no, nah, I don't have to take that. And I was like, wait, how did you not have to take it? And they're like, well, I took it in high school. I was like, damn, you're a nerd. Like you must've been really smart. And they're like, no, you could take an AP class and it counts as college credit. I was like, well, my high school didn't have that. And I, true story. And they were like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure it had it. I was like, no, nah, I literally never heard that before. Like we didn't have that. And so they were like, no, you had it. So I called a friend, like the smartest kid that I knew. And I was like, yo, man, uh, you ever heard of these AP classes? And he was like, yeah, dude, I was in all of them. You just weren't in them. And I was like, oh, well, got it. So I wasn't in any honors. Guys, I wasn't in any AP class. I was just in the normal stuff, just chilling. We talk about this all the time. If we had met when we were in high school or college, like, first of all, you would have been be... fawning over me. Oh, yeah. Then like, sure. wow, For look at that sure. stud. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of education, Jeff Bezos is opening a tuition-free preschool for underserved children called Bezos Academy. Uh, I like this idea. So it actually looks really good. I looked through some of the pictures, but I don't know what the level of education is. He he announced the details in an Instagram post on Tuesday. It's the first location of a network of tuition-free preschools serving children in underserved communities spearheaded by Bezos' philanthropic arm Day One Fund. Yeah, but basically so, he's going to use Montessori type education, yeah, right? It's inspired by Montessori. Yeah, no brainer. Um, no it brainer. says the new school, the new school, will which will serve three to five years year olds. Wow, that that's a typo on CNN Business. Come on, will be located in Des Moines, Washington, and it will open on October seventeenth. The selection process are based on a wide range of data, the fund says, which include income levels, participation in free and reduced cost meal programs, and gaps in access to licensed child care providers. I love this. Even though, you know, many of you may have opinions about Bezos, I'm all about opening schools. There's a there's a saying in Bulgarian, those who those who open schools close prisons. It's probably true. All right, what's next? Okay, hold on. What do you mean hold on? We don't got time to hold on. Hold on. The people are busy. I'm busy. So, Let's go. 
California governor wants all new cars sold in the state to be zero emissions by 2035. He wants a lot of things, this guy. <laughs> Gavin Newsom announced an executive order requiring that all new passenger cars and trucks sold in the state be zero emission vehicles by 2035. Is that allowed for him to do an executive order on something like this? I mean, this is just classic political pandering. It's like PR, right? Yeah, it's just, oh, 2035. That's like 15 years from now. And it's going to be zero emission anyways, because that's what is most economical for the car manufacturers. Yeah, he, he sounds a little bit like the kid I wouldn't like in high school. Okay. Yeah, um, not, not a, whatever, that's fine. Final? You want to know a crazy stat about Gavin Newsom? No. Uh, the saying. governor of California? What? His ex-wife is now married to Donald Trump's son. That's not a stat. That's a that, fact. Whatever, stat, fact, whatever. And one ex-wife is now married. Wait, is that the same lady that was like crazy? I don't know. Well, I don't okay. know if anybody's crazy. I think you mean uh, being flamboyant. With no, her no, arms. no, no, no. During the Republican national. Yeah, being flamboyant with her arms. Flamboyant is one way to put it. Okay. Um, 2020's happiest states in America came out. What? what how, how far down on the list is New York? Not that far. What number? 17. 17? But guess who the top three are. Top three? If I had to guess, I'm going to go All with somewhere, somewhere in uh, the Pacific Northwest, maybe one. What? What is um, that? Like Oregon, Washington, somewhere up there. Uh, another one I'm going to go with is like uh, the Vermont, New Hampshire, somewhere up there. Mm. Uh, and then I'm going to go with uh, maybe somewhere in the like... New Mexico, Arizona, Denver mm. type area. What are they? I don't think you got any of them. Uh, I'll give you the top five. Hawaii, Utah, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Maryland. Okay, I got Utah. What the hell is in New area. Jersey up there? Oh, what is New Jersey doing No, up New there? Jersey uh, people, they just convince themselves they're happy. Oh, my God. They, they well, live in the armpit it's, it's of America. based on kidding, emotional. Kidding, kidding, kidding. My brother lives there. Emotional and physical well-being, work environment, community and environment rank. And that was just the total score overall. What do you think are the most miserable states? Uh, California. <laughs> <laughs> um, most miserable states? Maybe like North think, or South Dakota. Think opioids. Uh, West Virginia, yeah, that's Kentucky. The, well, it's West Virginia, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Kentucky. Um yeah. I feel That's like West bad. Virginia just always gets a bad rap, man. Hard life. Coal miner. Coal life. mining country. Okay. Yeah. All right, what's next? Bang, bang. Let's go. This day in fun fact trivia. On September 24th in 1794, U.S. President George Washington ordered a 15,000-man militia to suppress an uprising of Western Pennsylvania farmers. They were protesting an excise duty placed on stills and spirits distilled in the U.S. So George Washington was out here suppressing protests? Of course. Oh, my God. He, like, wrote the Constitution. <laughs> we're just going to leave that one alone. We're just going to, we're not, uh, we're, we're not going to touch that, guys. <laughs> but uh, why would he suppress freedom of speech in alcohol? I feel like alcohol is in the Constitution. You, dude, have you ever heard of something called prohibition? Yes. What is it? I used to work at a restaurant as a waitress that was called the, oh. Okay. No, you no, no, you no, must no, have really no. paid attention a, at work. It was a prohibition term. It's okay, but prohibition was when you couldn't drink. The, the, yeah. the Volstead. Do you know what a Volstead is? Yeah, of course. What, what is it? Huh? It's the Volstead Act, well, that's which the... is the National Prohibition Act. That was the restaurant I worked at. If you went to Athens, Georgia, between twenty guys, listen, eleven and okay. these this day in history nonsense is whatever. But I got a joke for you guys today. This joke is all time. It is. Do you know how to kill a circus clown? You go for the jugular. <laughs> Polina didn't let me say the three jokes that I wanted to say. She said they were too inappropriate for this kid's show. So I had to settle on that one. All right. Do you have any last words for the people? Um, it's my brother's birthday. Joe Pompliano, what up? Happy kind, birthday. And be kind to your friends. I haven't reminded you recently. All right, guys. That's it. See you tomorrow. Bang, bang. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Lunch Money as much as we did. And don't forget, Lunch Money is now sponsored by BlockFi. So go check them out. There's a link in the description that you can click on. I'm an investor, a user, and a huge fan. What?
you're a bigger fan of BlockFi than you are of me? BlockFi is my second favorite thing in the world behind Polina. <laughs> They've got three products. <laughs> they can give you a U.S. dollar loan. You can earn up to 8.6% interest on an interest-bearing account, or you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies on their crypto exchange. I personally use the interest-bearing account. There's not very many places where you'll find up to 8.6% interest on a deposit in an interest-bearing account. Go do your own research. There's risk associated, but 8.6% is pretty compelling. So click on the link in the description. Say thanks to the folks at BlockFi. Subscribe to our channel. Like the video. Annoy Polina in the comments. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. And be kind to your friends.